Okay, welcome to lecture 4.1. Today we're going to talk about angular kinematics, and this is going to involve how do we figure out the angular velocities and angular accelerations of reference frames when they are uh, rotating with respect to time, and how we properly get these uh, values and vectors when, we're, when observing these changes of the rotations and orientations uh, from various reference frames. Okay, Oops. so we'll start here. Um, main topic is angular kinematics. And um, like I said, we're going to think about uh, reference frames that are changing orientation with respect to time. So if I have here a reference frame that is A, for example, with mutually perpendicular unit vectors, and then I'll uh, draw some blob here. We call this the dynamics potato. And I'll draw that more, especially when we start to think, think about rigid bodies. But this potato is some object in space, and then we will affix a, another reference frame to this object. So I'll make this one. Like so we have some mutually uh, perpendicular unit vectors here that are going to be bx, by, and BZ, and then we'll call this uh, reference frame B. And this thing is moving uh, in time with respect to A. So if I'm standing in A and I'm watching what B is doing, we're interested in uh, the angular velocity and angular acceleration uh, of this object. So there is some vector that describes the angular velocity of B with respect to A. And we're going to write that as the oops, as uh, omega bar. It is a vector, right, of reference frame B when observed when the change in time, the or the change in orientation with respect to time is observed from reference frame A. So that's some arbitrary vector. And we can think about at any instant of time a uh, a rotation uh, about that vector that is capturing this angular velocity. Right. And similarly, for angular acceleration, there's some other vector that we're going to call alpha of this reference frame B when the change in time is observed from reference frame A. <clears throat> so these two vectors we're interested in calculating and we're going to learn how to do that here. Um, the first thing I want to start with then is angular velocity. So um, we're going to introduce the definition of angular velocity. Of a reference frame B and the change in orientation is observed from A. reference frame A. 
So mathematically, the de definition of this angular velocity of B and A is defined as the time derivative of the by unit vector when observed from A dotted with the bz unit vector and that scalar is then the measure number for the bx coordinate and then similarly for the other two coordinates or to, uh, sorry the other two measure numbers we're going to have b c with respect to time dotted with the x and that's the the y measure number and then finally we have this so this is the definition of angular velocity and I'm covering it up with my uh, uh, screen so let me move that And I guess it doesn't fit on the page. So let's just make a new page and I'll move everything down there. And didn't get everything. Try one more time. All right, there we go. That's now readable. So there's our definition of angular velocity. And you can uh, read my online notes and read uh, Keynes' uh, 1985 book too to get a little more information on that. But um, the key thing that uh, for practical use is that we can apply this definition. by expressing uh, bx, by, and bz in A and then taking the time derivatives with respect to A. Note that uh, you know I say the word expressing, and then taking the time derivative with respect to a. Those two things are not equivalent, right? You can write any vector and express it in any reference frames, uh, mutually uh, perpendicular unit vectors. But when we're observing the change in time from a reference frame, we're going to be taking derivatives. Okay, so expressing a vector in a reference frame and taking a derivative with respect to a reference frame are different things and you're going to have to keep that in mind as you move forward but let's do something simple here right if i have a bx and i know that i have a time varying measure number a1 and i can express bx like so with a1 a2 and a3 all being time varying measure numbers then the time derivative of bx with respect to t in when observed from the reference frame a is this which we've all already learned right so there is one of the components and you can apply that 
directly and you could figure out these measure numbers and calculate an angular velocity. Okay, and uh, some of your homework problems will ask you to do that and you can uh, see some more examples in the online notes page that match this video. But that's the key thing. We can make the, we can then dot this with the appropriate thing and we get our answer. All right, so that's all I'm going to say about that. Um, it turns out, though, from that definition, there are more useful theorems. that uh, are a little easier to use and a little more helpful than applying the definition directly. All right, so I wanna take a motivating example uh, to talk about and apply and think about these theorems. And that example is um, an interesting kinetic sculpture that is here in Rotterdam. And it uh, stood out, I haven't actually seen it in person, but I'm, maybe I'll go find it today. Um, but the key thing is, let me grab, this is the, oh yeah, let me show you first the, website. All right, so this is the sculpture. Um, it's it's uh, these big two metal plates uh, mounted on a pole and they actually can move. It's called the turning two turning vertical rectangles built in 1971 uh, by George Rickey and uh, it is installed here in the city of Rotterdam. Uh, but what caught my attention was during last week's lecture, uh, I, uh, we were having Storm Eunice come through, which brought quite heavy winds to the country. And uh, somebody posted this video of uh, this sculpture having quite a lot of fun in the winds there. So um, this, this uh, we're gonna think about the angular velocity of these plates. Um, and we're going to calculate them, the angular acceleration, and we're going to uh, then in the translational lecture look at uh, the velocity of specific points and the acceleration of specific points. So this um, is a nice example here. Um, as an engineer, right, so this thing is being hit by very uh, strong winds. Uh, it could fly apart, right, if it was too weak. Um, so there, or, or the winds are simply too strong, eventually this thing could uh, come apart and that's not what you want to do. I'm not sure if artists do stress calculations but uh, from your other courses you know you could calculate the stress in these uh, pieces if you knew the forces acting on the system and determine whether or not uh, you've made a strong enough uh, design to withstand certain wind forces. Well in this class we're, we, we're going to be able to eventually calculate the forces right so at each joint uh, maybe critical locations where the stresses are high. You want to know the forces that are keeping that material stuck together or the joint um, uh, together and things aren't breaking. Um, so eventually we're going to be able to calculate those forces of something like this. And that would be a useful information for then a engineer that's going to calculate the stresses and strains and make sure this thing is strong enough. And um, this is a piece of art, but all public uh, infrastructure you know, has to withstand uh, dynamic forces on it. And, uh, and this is a nice ex example of, of one that would have to. All right, so we're gonna work with this figure that gives us a uh, configure, I'll call this a configuration sketch. And you should be getting good at drawing these, right, yourself for different problems. Um, here, I've drawn out the main parts of this. The um, we first have this reference frame in, that is the base, that's the earth, um, and a point O. And then we have this uh, main uh, pillar that the uh, system is mounted on. And then there's this uh, axis, and I'm only um, gonna draw one of the plates uh, because uh, of the symmetry, we'd, we would be able to uh, calculate similarly the same things. But um, this uh, uh, T-bar, at the top will rotate about the AZ equal to NZ 
right, through angle alpha, and that's that first rotation. And then if we come out to the plate, the plate then can rotate around this AX equal to BX axis through the angle beta, okay? And you can ignore uh, the points. Uh, we'll talk about them in the next lecture. Uh, but we want, we're going to look at all, all these unit vectors. So you do want to understand that uh, reference frame B, the plate, is oriented uh, using beta to A, and then A is oriented to N using alpha. Right. Um, we also are going to look at this distance D, right, the distance from point P to C, and that's going to come into play in a couple of our calculations. Um, and I think those are the main, the main things. So point P and S are going to be important. Uh, distance D, alpha, and beta, and then all of the unit vectors associated with each reference frame. And I'll come back to that picture as uh, we need it. All right. So we have this uh, kinetic sculpture, and. Um, I think it is helpful to let me just bring it bring a copy of it down. So I can draw beside it. I will copy and then paste. That leaves me enough screen real estate. All right, so uh, the first theorem that I that arrived from the definition of angular velocity, I'll just call this theorem one of angular velocity, right? That is that if I have a vector, a unit vector, AX, fixed in reference frame A, and I want to take um, the time derivative with respect to frame n, All right? So we have ax, and I want to see, well, how is ax moving when viewed from n? It turns out that uh, this is true. If I have the angular velocity of a in n, I can simply cross it with that vector ax to find uh, the derivative that I'm after, okay? So this presupposes that we have the angular velocity of a and n, um, but in, uh, generally we do and we can, and I'll show you that calculation. The consequence of this is, is that if we have a X and then some angular velocity that's uh, at an arbitrary angle and I'll make it try to look like that uh, from a X. All right. If I cross omega a into a x, I then get the result that will be perpendicular to both uh, parts. Okay, I'm still on the screen there. So um, this right will be perpendicular to a x because of the cross product. That wasn't that great and this okay so this vector then just has the length uh, which is the magnitude of uh, that angular velocity vector and that is the derivative that we're after so it's a nice property that vector is going to always be perpendicular and we can calculate it with this cross product, okay? Um, but this is key that we know, right, AX, uh, let me put an if, this is true, if AX is fixed in A, okay? All right, so for our problem, we can um, think about this um, more specifically. So in our case, um, A is a simple orientation through alpha about the NZ, AZ axis there, right? 
So um, we have uh, write that. through that angle alpha. So for simple rotations like this, simple orientations, uh, the angular velocity vector is also quite simple. We then know that this is going to be uh, alpha dot in z, z or alpha dot az. Right? They're both az and nz um, are the axis we're ro rotating about. If you apply the angular velocity definition, um, very carefully, uh, and I do that in the online notes, you find that this is true. So um, we can now cross that to get our derivative. So alpha dot az crossed with ax. Well, if I cross uh, z into x, I get y. So then we know that alpha dot there is um, in the y direction. Right. So that's the first uh, theorem, and we can make use of that. This extends nicely to uh, if ax is an arbitrary vector that's also fixed in A, um, we can come up with theorem number two. So the second theorem for angular velocity. is that um, if we have a vector uh, fixed um, in A and we're going to choose a specific vector for our problem I'm going to take the position vector from P to S okay if I come back up to my figure P and S are here. We see that uh, P and S, this vector from P to S, is fixed in A, right? It rotates with A, so that's fixed in A. And uh, we can describe it by the distance D times the negative AX unit vector, right? So it's in the opposite direction, so we'll do that. So if, if vector D, AX, like so. And then D uh, is constant here. Uh, so that vector is fixed in A. And if it's fixed in A, then uh, we have a similar uh, nice result. And that means that the time derivative of a vector fixed in A, which are from P to S, is 1. I take the time derivative, and I want it in the in frame then this is true that the angular velocity of a and n crossed with that vector r from p to s so that's nice uh, we can then apply this just like we did before um, we have a, a new vector here we already have our angular velocity of a and n which is alpha dot a z so we can put in an alpha dot az cross that with our negative ax and if we do that cross product correctly we're going to get that the direction is in the negative ay so we're going to get and we have these two scalars so we get d uh, times alpha dot in the negative ay direction okay so that's theorem number two we can calculate the velocities of fixed vectors any fixed vector um, and a unit vector like AX is one uh, with these simple cross products. Okay, so that's quite nice. All right, well, what if the vector is not fixed in A? So we're going to then have our third theorem. If uh, now let's suppose that. D is not constant now. Uh, 
All right, so d is going to be a function of time in this case. Uh, if we come back to our figure, this would mean that d could open up or close, like so. It's maybe you would uh, you imagine a sliding joint on the top of this t, and the and the plate gets you know move away from the in z axis. All right, so now we have a non-fixed vector there and um, then what is true uh, if we take the same derivative of uh, this vector from P to S we want it in the in frame there is additional component so it's going to look similar except that we need now the derivative of our vector of interest with respect to time in the A-frame, okay? So now uh, that vector is changing. So we have this A-frame portion, and then we just add uh, the prior uh, theorem. So this term here accounts for the fact that uh, R is now changing when viewed from A also. So if we apply that in our case, um, we remember we still have the same vector uh, or position vector. If I take, let me just write that down again. So remember, right, this was negative d in the a x direction, right? So um, this term, now that d is changing in a, but a x is not, then we know that that first term, I think I need a new page, that first term then is going to be d a r p to s will be negative d dot, right, a x. Okay, and then the whole derivative in n we just add our prior result. Which was negative d alpha dot a y. Okay. So this was, uh, as again, this vector is uh, um, not fixed in a, in a um, it changes in a so we have to calculate this derivative term with respect to a plus the term uh, the omega crossed r term there so that is our uh, third theorem that we've applied all right for the, and then we have one last theorem for angular velocity that is quite useful so this one is that if I want to know the angular velocity of B in N, and let's go back up and look at our figure. All right, so we've got N, A, and B. And in our case, um, we have these successive simple orientations about a single axis. And if we're interested in the angular velocity of B, the plate in N, but maybe um, because we have these simple orientations, it's very easy to find the angular velocity of A in N and the angular velocity of B in A. Well, it turns out that this is true. If we then have the angular velocity of A in N, we simply have to add the angular velocity of B and A to get the one we want, right? So these, right, are tied to some successive orientation relationship that we showed there, and then um, we can get the values that we want there by summing them. And this goes, you can extend that summation right, for <clears throat> as many successive orientations as you want, and it's usually easier to come up with these uh, simpler angular velocity vectors and then just sum them up to get your final one yeah 
All right, so for <clears throat> ours, we knew that this already, right? We have alpha dot and the AZ. And then uh, similarly, easy to calculate, B and A is going to be beta dot about the AX axis. Right? So if we apply our formula here, This is a nice and easy. We can write that like so. All right. So that uh, ends it for the these four theorems that are going to be useful for calculating angular velocities. And just to recap, uh, the first one, we have a vector ax fixed in A, but we want the time derivative in N. We can use the angular velocity of a and n and cross it with that vector, that unit vector fixed in a to get the answer. This extends uh, actually to any vector that is uh, fixed in a, so it doesn't have to be a unit vector. And so we had an example here, um, and it's uh, the same type of thing, cross the angular velocity with the vector fixed in a. If the vector is not fixed in a, it changes when viewed from a. Uh, and we had an example where that d value was not constant, then you have to make sure you have this new term here. Right? This is the uh, relative time, der uh, time derivative for, for reference stream A. So I, I see what the change is of our in A, and I add it to uh, the prior result, which is this angular velocity of A and N crossed with that vector. And we get the um, final answer here, where it, will have a more complex angular velocity expression. Lastly, um, you can take uh, typically simpler angular velocity vectors and sum them up to get a more complex one. And that's helpful because uh, these simpler, these angular velocities are usually sim easier to come about. And then you can sum instead of trying to formulate uh, the angular velocity vector. Uh, for some complexly oriented bodies. All right. So if you have Euler rotations of three, you can add up those three angular velocities to get your uh, angular velocity associated with the Euler rotation, for example. All right, so that was angular velocity. Now let's introduce angular acceleration. Angular acceleration. Um, so similar to angular velocity, uh, angular acceleration is a vector. And um, the definition of the angular acceleration of B when observed from A is going to be this. We're going to use alpha bar as that vector. So A and N, and sorry, this was supposed to be N. Oh, no, actually I screwed up both of those. Definition of angular acceleration of A when observed from N. Sorry about that. Is going to be alpha bar of A with respect to N. And we define that here is the time derivative in n of the angular velocity vector of a in n. And that's it. So we need to take that derivative of this vector, omega a in n, in the n frame to get our, our angular acceleration vector. So back to our example, we recall that the angular velocity of a and n was simply alpha dot in z, or can be written as alpha dot a z because those are vector. That's the shared unit vector uh, for that simple rotation. And if I then 
uh, take the derivative of this in in and I'll use uh, alpha dot and Z and Z So we're taking that in z does not change in n, so we just have to take the derivative of the scalar of the measure number. And that's going to be alpha double dot to represent the uh, twice time to differentiated scalar there. Uh, and that's also in the in z direction. So that's pretty straightforward. All right. Um, now we've got a couple of theorems for angular acceleration. Okay, so the first one is that if I have these reference frames A and N, It turns out that this derivative in N is equal to the derivative in A. So if you observe an angular velocity back vector here of A and N in the N frame or the A frame, you're going to get the same result. They both uh, will be um, the same. The same no matter what, no, not, not no matter what, but no matter uh, what frame, A or N, and only those two frames, right, you observe the change from. So um, we can see that with our simple example here. If I take d a in, but now take it in the a frame, well, I would ex express that in the a frame to make my take my derivative. So then that's going to be. Then we get alpha double dot a z which we know that a z uh, equals n z so we get the same result there okay so that's pretty convenient um, there's nothing different we can use we can take the derivative of the angular velocity vector in either of those associated frames to get the, the answer we want and that's nice because maybe um, it's easier to take the derivative in one of the other frames, often the A frame, uh, if you have omega of A and N expressed in A, then you can use this one. If you had it expressed in N, then you can use this one. And we'll see later on how um, that will be simpler. All right, um, that was theorem one. There's one more theorem for angular acceleration, and then I think we're done with. Uh, this topic other than showing you some of these simpi mechanics things. So we'll call this theorem two for the angular acceleration. All right. So unfortunately, if I want the angular acceleration of B in N, so the plate was B and then the ground was in, and we had this intermediate frame A. Um, for angular velocity, this something like this is true, right? We can write A of N plus B and A. For angular acceleration, this is a big not true. Okay, so that does not apply. You do not get this addition theorem. Um, so you have to take your derivatives more carefully uh, in, that in that case. So you cannot uh, 
some angular accelerations. Okay, do not sum them. You will not get the right answer. And I'll give you a, a demonstration here from our example. We know that uh, this is true already. A and N uh, is alpha double dot AZ. We just calculated that. Similarly, if I write alpha beta, I'm sorry, alpha of B in A, uh, we would get the same kind of result. It would be beta double dot, and this would be about the bx or the ax, the shared um, axes there. I can express this angular velocity vector in the B frame, and that would look like this. Okay, so now I have them both expressed in the B frame. And we first then, uh, I'll have, uh, we'll try to calculate this um, angular velocity. So I'm going to, I want the angular velocity of B and N. And I take its time derivative to get its angular acceleration of B and N. All right. We know that this is equal to this. Right, I can take that derivative with respect to either frame. Uh, it's a nice property of angular acceleration we just learned. So uh, that's convenient because now I have uh, these expressed in um, the, am I doing this right? I'm going to be an in B. Oh, yes, I'm doing this right. So let me just put this reminder up here. Awesome. So I can write, I have, uh, I can write these, um, uh, and actually, why I'm getting confused is because I haven't written down omega of B and N. And uh, we had that, we had already calculated it in, in the angular velocity section. So we know that the angular of B and N is alpha dot A Z plus beta dot A X, right? So we can write that in A, uh, uh, in the A frame. And um, the, do, 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 do. I think I wrote, man, why am I getting confused? Did I write this wrong in my notes? It's B and N. I want to take uh, the angular velocity in B, express it in B. Oh, yeah. All right, I, I'm clear now. So we have this expressed in A, and um, I want to express omega of B and N in the B frame because I want to take the derivative here in the B frame. So that's where I was getting uh, a little confused on my notes. It's okay. So let's do that. This would then look like alpha dot sine beta in the BY direction and uh, plus alpha dot cosine beta in the bz direction plus beta dot in the bx direction. Okay, so I've, I've taken the angular velocity of b and a, which we already found out uh, earlier from the summation theorem. We expressed it in a, though. I can also express that in b, and now I can take the derivative easily with respect to B because I can just take the derivative of these measure numbers, right? So let's do that. Like that is that term. And 
I don't have space here. So D in omega B and N DT equals the time derivative of this here. Right? Now what is that? It's a little nasty. Do the easy one first. Beta double dot Vx. Yeah. And then we have uh, these multiplicative terms here. So we're going to have to apply the product rule. So we'll, for the by term, we'll get an alpha double dot sine beta plus a alpha dot sine beta times a beta dot. We have to apply the chain rule there in the by direction. And then I'll write the second one here. Similarly, alpha double dot cosine beta uh, plus alpha dot that's going to be a minus cosine oh no that's not uh, derivative of oh yeah cosine is going to be a minus sine beta chain rule beta dot bc yeah. All right, so this is, do I have room here? Alpha of beta in it. All right, so we've taken uh, the time derivative. I just wrote omega b and n, expressed it in b, took time derivatives of the measure numbers, and I've got my answer, All right? Well, if we were to sum these two things, Right, we can already see that um, this term here is present, so the alpha of b and a. But the alpha of a and n, if we if we were to sum that, we've only got this alpha double dot sine beta, alpha double dot cosine beta. So you see something like we see them here, but these two terms are not present. Right, so these terms. Um, are the missing terms. If you were just to sum these two things, you do not get the answer that I've shown below here. So that demonstrates that this theorem um, does not uh, hold. If you were thinking of a, a, an addition theorem, does not hold, and you need to be very careful about calculating your angular acceleration vectors. Okay. All right, that's uh, the end here of the um, notes. And I want to show you a few things on SimPy mechanics, uh, primarily to, uh, let's see, let's go to boop, here. And uh, here. To a new notebook and call this uh, Angular. Yeah, we'll just call it Angular. All right, let me get the uh, SimPy imported. And I'm going to use the init v printing function here from mechanics so that we uh, uh, get the dot so instead of doing a ddt, we get the dot notation. All right. Okay, so to set up our uh, system, we have these reference frames. And then I'll use the quick form here a, b equals sm dot symbols uh, in a b and then class equals me reference frame All right there's the reference frames we have these uh, simple rotations that we can set up among them and uh, a dot orient axis relative to n um, oh yeah we need some variables first let's do that we had alpha beta 
And then let's go ahead and make D, and I'll make it a uh, time varying variable in this case. So we make them all dynamic symbols to make sure that they are time varying to see if we get the same results as before. Now I orient my reference frames. A dot orient axis relative to N through angle alpha. And this one was about the uh, shared Z axis. And then I'll do B dot orient axis relative to A through beta. And that was about the shared A axis, A X axis, right? All right, so I have my orientation set up. The primary new functions here that are useful, um, if I do uh, a dot angular velocity in reference frame in, it'll calculate that angular velocity. And I have a alpha dot in the in z direction, which is what we found before. I can take that uh, derivative and um, express it in the A frame, and I should see that we have these uh, same uh, terms there. Right? This calculation um, applies the definition of the angular velocity. So if you have your orientation set up, the angular velocity would be calculated properly. Now, um, we also had angular velocity of v in A, which is simple. And we know that the angular velocity of A and N plus the angular velocity of B and A, right, is just as a simple summation. And I can also just simply ask for B in N, and I get my um, same result, right? So angular velocity n will automatically do the summation um, if you have your orientation set up properly. And I just realized I do have this view.